Very good. All right. Well, we're going to look at when a believer is in ship shape condition. And we're in Matthew 25, starting in the 31st verse and going to the 36th verse. And my dad was a military man, and whenever he would tell us to clean our room, uh, he would say, now, okay, now let's get this room in ship shape condition. Well, our passage, Matthew 25, 31 to 36, permits us to look into the future and see a vision of Christ on the throne of judgment. And before him, being judged, are believers that Christ deems to be in shipshape condition. Now, let me read the passage to you. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came and visited me. I want you to notice these words. He will separate the people one from another as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And as those who our passage is focused upon are the sheep, uh, I'm tempted to change the phrase from ship shape condition to sheep shape condition. Uh, now notice our passage examines what believers do for Jesus that is going to be rewarded. So we have to put in here a very strong caution. And that is, when you consider that following this, in the, between the 41st and the 45th verse, we learn that the goats are damned because they did nothing for Jesus. On the surface, it appears as if the text is teaching that good people who do good things go to heaven, whereas bad people who don't do good things uh, do not go to heaven. And, of course, nothing could be further from the truth, so you will allow me some short amount of time to uh, destroy this false view. We have to notice that the sheep, that is, the believers, are, as we're told in verse 34, uh, told to come who are blessed of my Father and take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Or, as the King James Version puts it, come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So you can see that this couldn't possibly be a salvation that is based upon good works because this is a kingdom that was prepared for them before they ever did any good works. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we, again, believers, are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. They were prepared in advance before we were ever Christians. They were prepared before we were ever born. So we can't possibly be saved because of our good works. And, and besides all that, they're not even our good works. They're his works, works that he has prepared. Eden Getty said, a, a dog is not a dog because it wags its tail. It wags its tail because it is a dog. And so we're not saved because we act like Christians. Rather, we act like Christ because we're saved. So if you want to look at it another way, uh, we act in a certain way because we're God's workmanship. C.S. Lewis has something to say about this. He said, the Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good. They hope that by being good, they can please God if there is a God. Or if they think there is not, at least they can hope to deserve approval from good men. But the Christian thinks that any good that he does comes from the Christ life that's inside of him. He does not think that God will love us because we are good, rather, but that God will make us good because he loves us. Just as the roof of the greenhouse does not attract the sun because it's so bright, but it becomes bright merely because the sun shines upon it. We know from cover to cover, and its doctrine we 
do not blush to repeat, that salvation is of entirely a free grace. It is not because of good deeds that we are done that God accepts us. Uh, Romans 3.20, if I just to provide you with one verse, says, therefore, nobody will ever be declared righteous before God through obeying the law. The law. Um, moreover, uh, you go to Romans 14.23, and it says that actually lost people don't have any good works. Because if it's not a faith, it's sin. So everything that they do doesn't amount to anything before a holy God. Well, if sinners, if the human race is incapable of producing good works, how do they ever produce good works? Well, see, another way to look at it is salvation is about transformation, becoming what 2 Corinthians 5.17 calls a new creature in Christ Jesus. What Ephesians 2.10 just called God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So in conclusion, this is not talking about good people going to heaven and people who don't do good things not going to heaven. It's merely talking about the good works that believers do that God so highly prizes because they're evidences of his workmanship in them. So let's spend our time looking at these good works that the believer produces that, 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 that on the day of judgment will say you are in sheep shape condition. What are they? Uh, what, what, what are these men and women doing? W what is this evidence that we are truly saved, that we are God's workmanship? Notice what the first one is. It's the care of the needy. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. How about that? First thing that God's going to look at is not your theology, whether you're reformed or whether you know the four spiritual laws, or whether, whether you're a mid-tribulation rapture soul, or whatever, uh, it's, it's that you, you, you met people's needs. Isn't that something? Actually, the needs of the stomach here. Um, you know, mothers used to say about their daughters that the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Uh, in Europe, wealthy people would send their daughters off to finishing school with the hope that that would make them more eligible. Uh, there's an old poem that says, it's no good if you can turn a man's head by being good looking, if you turn his stomach by horrible cooking. Uh, there's yet another rhyme that used to circulate in society that said, a girl can catch a man with face powder, but it takes baking powder to keep him. Uh, all I can say is, <laughs> wherever that is actually true about an individual man, it certainly doesn't say much about that man. And uh, in fact, he, he rather belongs more to that condemned group that's mentioned in Philippians chapter 3 of, who are described as having their belly as their God. But it is well worth noting that Jesus modeled that the way to reach out to the heart of the world is through their stomachs. And that is to address their temporal needs before and alongside attempting to minister to their spiritual needs. The evidence that we are God's workmanship produces, and you know, that we have genuine faith, is that we care practically for the needy. James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith, but he has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says, oh, go, I, I, I wish you well, Keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about those physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, of course, let's give another theological caution here, which is this is not talking about faith plus works saves you. It's talking about faith that works is what saves you. And genuine faith does work. How pleasing can it possibly be to God for us to insist to a person that the God we serve loves them when we ourselves are not prepared to model an atom of that practical love? 1 John 3, 17 said, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? That is to say, nobody's going to see God's love in you or in your gospel if you're not modeling it to them in some practical way. 
Okay, now this is where our theology needs to be straightened out again, or at least uh, we need to confirm that we're on the right path. Am I teaching that sinners will come to Christ because they just really appreciate the love of God that you've shown them? You could just like win them over by being super nice. The answer is emphatically no. Uh, the Bible is adamant from cover to cover that mankind is spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. Buying somebody lunch is not going to breathe divine life in them. In fact, it might not even necessarily be appreciated at all. Um, the issue is not what conduct is it that pleases sinners when we share the gospel. The, the, the issue is what is the conduct that we must gauge in that pleases God when we share the gospel? You know, the scripture says in numerous places that we are co-workers with Jesus Christ. So the whole question is what conduct seen in his children does God delight in being a co-worker alongside? Uh, let me put it another way. Now you might think, well, you're rather laboring a subtle point here, aren't we? Yes, but it's a huge theological point in the track where you go the right way or the wrong way if you don't get this right. Let me make it as simple as this. Nobody was ever saved because believers were Christ-like. But God is pleased to save people through believers that are Christ-like. In Romans 15, 18, Paul said that uh, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and by what I have done. Now notice what he just said. What Christ has accomplished in leading the Gentiles to obey God. So right there you have salvation is, from, is a work of God from start to finish. But God was pleased to accomplish it through me by what I've said and what I've done. In other words, God was pleased to accomplish it through me when what I've done matched what it is that I said. What it is that I preached. What's the major reason, probably, that God brought so many people to Christ through the Apostle Paul? I think he tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, where he writes to the church and talks about my way of life in Christ Jesus that agrees with what I teach in every church. There's a, there's a fellow in sheep-shaped condition. 1 Peter 3 Verse 1 and 2 says, Wives, in the same way be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe in the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Titus 2, 9, 10, Paul's instructing Timothy, and he says, Teach believing servants to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about our Lord and Savior attractive. To which the Reformed theologian immediately responds with, how on earth is that going to ha happen when the Bible teaches that, that sinners will never find anything attractive about Jesus Christ? Isaiah 53, he said, no form or comeliness that any lost person could possibly want that actually he'd be he's a person who's despised and rejected of mankind here's the answer should god be pleased to open the eyes of a sinner it is god's will that they should see in an attractive display of christ's beauty in us that's it in john 10 37 jesus said to his opponents do not believe me unless I do what my father does. In other words, that now you're accountable. Now you're accountable. So what leaves the sinner without excuse for his unbelief or her unbelief is when that unbelief flies in the face of believers doing what their father does. When that unbelief flies in the face of the love of God on display. When what it is when their unbelief flies in the face of the truth of God in action. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. 
Now let's immediately take a parenthesis here to address a concern of theirs, which would have been ours had it not been written here. Uh, uh, verse 37 to 39, they say, well, when, when did we do these things for you, Lord? Verse 40, the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of these, the least of my brethren, you did that for me. So on, on the judgment day, the first characteristic of the believer who is in sheep-shaped condition is the care of the needy. The care of the needy, and secondly, the companionship of the stranger. Verse 35, look at the second part of it. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Now, what is God referring to when he said a stranger? Well, in Acts 17, 21 and Matthew 27, 7, the very same word, Greek word, that's translated stranger here is translated foreigner. That's talking about somebody who's different from you, somebody whose skin is a different color from you, somebody who's, 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 who eats kimchi, <laughs> somebody who eats things that you would never eat. You know, somebody who's just totally not a part of your society. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, the Greek word that's translated here, stranger, refers to strangers to God's covenant. We're talking about lost people. Actually, you can go to Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, and believers are described as aliens and strangers in this earth. So it could be them. And here he says, I was a stranger, and you invited me in. It's just talking about inviting people into your life that you would normally never have anything to do with. Actually, that's what the church should be like. You should have black people, white people, uh, you know, people who dress freaky, people who are poor, people who are rich, people, it's, it's just a breakdown of society's barriers because we're all one in Jesus Christ. The first church that I pastored was a small church, um, as I look around me, uh, a <laughs> larger church than this, and uh, it, 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 it was way out in the outback of, uh, of Missouri, but there were no strangers there because everybody's practically interrelated, uh, but uh, they were aliens. And that is that there were obviously lots of people in the town that the people of the church wouldn't normally invite into their fellowship or society. And so it is with us. There are smelly people. There are bad-mannered people. There are unthankful people. People with addictions, people that are homeless, people that are suffering from AIDS or something else, homosexuals, Pe people who are just so different that, 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 that we we're, we're smile at them in the store, but we don't invite them into our lives. Luke 14, 23, Jesus <clears throat> says, says to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. Go after the stranger. Go after the person who could never possibly repay you for any investment. Certainly not in this life could they repay you. Eden Paul wrote, the church that resembles Jesus is a body of people who gathers the roughest stones from their own backyard from which Jesus cuts his most brilliant diamonds. Now actually, it's, think about it, it's unethical to be financially supporting foreign missions if we're turning a blind eye to the people in our own backyard. Tell you a true story. Ali Hafid was a Persian farmer who despised his farm and <clears throat> sold it, and went off into the world uh, hoping to become rich with, by discovering diamonds. Well, he never found any, and he died in poverty in a foreign land. If you can believe it, the famous diamond bells of, uh, beds of Galconda were discovered on the very farm that he had sold and abandoned. Well, let that not be true of us. We leave these jewels in our own backyard, people that cross our path almost every day, and yet we, we, we never invited them in. How do I invite them in? I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Well, Jesus has a little comment on that in Luke 16, where he says in verse 9, I tell you, Use your world, worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And that is, spend your money investing it in relationships with people that normally you would have nothing in common with so that one day when you go to heaven, they'll be waiting there to meet you. 
to thank you because you invested in them. Hebrews 13, 2, and don't forget to entertain strangers, for so, by so doing, people have entertained angels and been unaware of it. So the character of a believer who's in sheep-shaped condition is he cares for the needy. He's a companion to the stranger. And thirdly, he clothes the naked. Verse 36, I needed clothes, and you clothed me. Now, the Greek word here for clothed is a, is a fascinating word. It's, it's made up of two Greek words. It's paribalo. And, and it, it, it actually is, it carries the idea of not only clothing somebody, but to throw around and invest in them. That's what the word means. So Jesus isn't saying here, you covered my nakedness with a packet of old rags you bought from the Salvation Army that were used. He's saying, you lavishly invested in me. Do you know something? Basil Paul was addressing this passage and he said, some will say you just threw all your money around investing in people who will count for nothing. And Jesus will say you threw your money all around investing in people, some of who will count for eternity. I, I needed clothes and you lavishly clothed me. The care of the needy, companionship of the stranger, clothe the naked, and the fourth characteristic is they comforted the sick. Verse 36, I was sick and you looked after me. Palance Henry said, love never expresses itself more clearly than in times of sickness. I think I may have told you once, but my, my dear old mother had a, a mother who was just uh, like Jesus. She's introduced me to Jesus, actually. Um, we should all met her. But, she is so much like Jesus that when, my, when she died, my mother was still unbeliever. But she put on her grave, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So this fantastic woman died. Years, years later, after my mother had become a Christian, I said, you ever miss your mother? She said, oh, no. Um, and then she paused and with glistening eyes, she said, I only miss her when I'm sick. Care of the needy, companionship of the stranger, clothe the naked, comfort to the sick. And the last characteristic of a believer who is in sheep-shaped condition is compassion for the incarcerated. Verse 36, I was in prison and you came and visited me. Well, that would include convicts, wouldn't it? Uh, but you know, it would also include all people who are shut in. This would include actually the whole world because Galatians 3.22 says the whole world is a prisoner of sin. Spurgeon preached for 40 years and his sermons were written down in shorthand and then sold in the printed form for a penny the next week. They were circulated around the world. Um, Spurgeon kept a record of the usefulness of his sermons and in, would you believe it, it, every single sermon he preached over 40 years he could write down next to it one person that he knew that got saved as a result of hearing that sermon. Is that marvelous? That is what every sermon except one was a sermon called Believing to See. And then 20 years after it was preached Spurgeon received the following letter. Dear Mr. Spurgeon, I write to you from a South American prison cell where I wait my execution. I suppose it is my debt to society for my crimes. I wanted to tell you that a short time ago, I received my lunchtime gruel and I noticed that some soul had slipped in with it one of your printed sermons called Believing to See. I I read the sermon and it changed my life. For in it, I found the living Christ. I wanted you to know that. Thanks to somebody that cared enough to reach into my cell of despair, and thanks to you, and thanks to my Jesus. Though yet I still languish in my chains, it is my pleasure to report to you, sir, that I am today the Lord's free man. Folks, the truth is that God has called us to conduct ourselves in this manner because 
When we hungered, he fed us with the bread of heaven. When we thirsted, he gave us to drink from the river of life. When we were strangers, strangers to his perfect ways, strangers to his beauty, he invited us in. When we were naked, he clothed us, clothed us with the robe of righteousness. When we were sick, I mean sick with the leprosy of sin from head to foot, he healed us. And when we were in prison, in prison to wickedness, death, and damnation, like Samson, he ripped up those gates of sin that stood between us and God and carried it on his shoulders, on his bleeding shoulders. He took it away. Shouldn't we then imitate him? Especially considering that, you know, some of these areas, if not all of them, are just not natural. We're not, it's not natural for us. Our sinful nature does not engage in this sort of thing. Shall we not imitate him and throw ourselves into the care of the needy, companionship with strangers, clothing the naked, comforting the sick, showing compassion for the incarcerated? Because these are the characteristics of Jesus Christ. And, and of course, the, the believer who is in sheep-shaped condition. Let's pray.